Book 4, Falcon in the Barn, Chapter 9. We are here to remember. An hour later, the Shin family walked to the amphitheater at the center of Edge. Well, more like weaved and squeezed their way. All of Edge was there, along with visitors from other villages. To Mari's amazement, there was no more room in the amphitheater, and people were waiting outside. Head for the soldiers, Perrin said, when they saw the crowds. We'll use them to sneak to the back entrance. I don't need to meet any members of the Committee of Retired Goat Milkers for Perrin Shin today. It was fortunate Lieutenant Offer was as tall as Perrin, something he confided to Mari that he hadn't noticed before about the reticent officer. Because Afra served well as a shield to smuggle the colonel past several groups of non-edgers, who really didn't know who they were watching for, but knew enough to look for insignias and name patches on uniforms. Behind and below the platform was a flurry of people. Several soldiers, Magistrate Wibble, Rector Young, and Lieutenant Colonel Karna were discussing the program. While the new Chief of Enforcement, Barney, directed some of his assistants in crowd control. But Mari found her eye caught by something else, her old favorite oak tree by the warm spring. She hadn't been behind the amphitheater since her and Perrin's last debate, when she thought she might never see him again. When she saw the oaks so much flooded back to her from their first tempestuous and wonderful season together, the tree had grown significantly over the years, despite being enclosed by the amphitheater and frequently covered overhead by oilskins when it rained during a performance. Mari stood there for a moment just to remember. Her family kept walking, but Perrin turned abruptly when he realized she was no longer with him. He smiled when he saw why. Been a long time, hasn't it? He returned to her, took hold of the trunk, and tried to shake it. It certainly doesn't move anymore. I once gave this tree a real thrashing. I came back after that last debate of ours, late at night, and tried to rip it out of the ground to take it back to the fort. Really? Mari said. Why? I thought it might be the last thing I'd have to remember you by, besides the holes I punched on my office wall. Mari laughed softly. There was something I always wanted to do by this tree, but... She looked around her timidly. Now is certainly not the time. Perrin's smile was full of mischief as he took a step closer. She hadn't seen that expression on his face in a long time, and she loved seeing it again. What is it? He asked, and the deep hushed tone that he knew always gave her goosebumps. Mari bit her lip and took another step closer to him. I guess this tree has the same appeal for me as that stand of trees back at the university had for you. Maybe you and I just have a thing for kissing in the trees. Mari grinned at the old parents she always knew and adored. Ooh, don't let Captain Thorne hear you say that. He'll turn us in on suspicion of secretly being garters. Perrin chuckled. That's why I left him at the fort today. But I promise that someday we'll sneak back here late at night, and do whatever you want under our tree. Mari's eyebrows went up. Perrin winked meaningfully to her, took her arm, and led her away. Mari and the children found the bench that had been saved for them at the front, while Perrin joined the others behind the platform to discuss the ceremony. By the time it started, every seat encircling the platform was taken, and any spot where a standing body could be wedged in was filled. Mari worried that some in attendance were there for the wrong reason, to see Colonel Shin, who was with the other presenters below and shielded by curtains. But soon it was evident everyone felt the land tremor as deeply as the Shin family had. When Rector Young took to the platform, the crowd grew silent. Just one year ago, no more than a hundred people knew who he was, and only half attended the sole congregational meetings. But after the land tremor, Attendance at his meetings included most of Edge. Then, just as quickly as his flock grew, it scattered again. After five or six weeks of listening to his sermons on healing and renewing, Edgers felt healed and renewed, especially after the caravan of supplies arrived from Idumea, and they stopped attending. When the crisis was gone, so was the need to feel the Creator. 
But this morning, the entire audience was bowed their heads as Rector Young led them in prayer. He thanked the Creator for preserving them, for sending the food that saw them through, and for the sacrifices of so many. It was a beautiful prayer, but Mari was sure she heard the distinct sound of snoring behind her. Young then introduced Lieutenant Colonel Karna, who joined him on the platform to great cheers and applause of the village, which had known him for so many years and was happy to see him return for the day. He read a description of what had happened to the village, gave a report on the buildings burned, damaged, and demolished, and amused the crowd with a recitation of the variety of meals served at the Shin House each night that first week. When he introduced Magistrate Wibble, a wisp of a man, there was only polite applause that greeted him. But the magistrate bowed and grinned as if they loved him as much as Karna. Wibble described in flowing detail the efforts to join together to help in cleaning up and rebuilding. He never seemed to remember that it was Colonel Shin who developed the plan. With great emotion that was mostly genuine, he retold the story of a family with twins that was found after all hope had been lost to recover any more people. At that point, Karna went down to the front steps and stood in front of the family sitting on the second row. He gently pulled up the emotional father and mother. They scooped up their young children and the crowd began to applaud as they wiped away tears. Then one man who was sitting next to them stood up. So did his wife, then another woman. Within seconds, the entire crowd was on their feet, applauding the family who were overcome with emotion. Karna helped them to sit back down, crouched in front of them, said a few quiet words as the crowd began to sit down as well. Mari watched the young couple's faces. They brightened as Karna spoke to them. Then they laughed and wiped away more tears. Karna gave their two children quick kisses. As he stood, Mari caught his eye. She grinned proudly and winked at him. He was no longer the hesitant but obedient lieutenant Perrin had dragged through the forest as they chased garters for the first time. Now Lieutenant Colonel Karna was every whit as capable and confident a leader as Perrin. Yet Brillin's light brown in complexion developed a slight shade of bashful pink as he walked back up to the podium stairs. Wibble spoke a little longer, but Mari couldn't remember what the flimsy voice said. He was sounding a little like a campaign speech about the value of living an edge. When it was clear that he was finally winding down to introduce the next speaker, Mari instinctively looked at the left side of the platform, where Perrin had always appeared at their debates. She saw him slowly walking up the stairs, partially shielded by a curtain, and reading a piece of parchment. Mari held her breath and took him in, remembering it was just over 17 years ago when he first bounded up those stairs, stopped, and stared at her with a look she now knew meant, Ah, Hogel, that is not an old spinster teacher. This morning at age 45, his face was more somber. He was a little thicker around the middle, certainly grayer along the edges, with lines etched more deeply around those dark eyes and with many more medals, ribbons, and patches on his dress uniform. But the cobblers of winds got it right, Mari thought. He was magnificent, even now, after this terrible year. No, especially now, because of this year. Choosing to continue to love him was the best decision she had ever made. What better thing could she have done with her life besides staying by his side? He was her life. He was almost to the top of the stairs now. Mari bit her lip and wondered if all women adored their husbands as much as she adored him. How would she feel about him in another 20 years, or 30 or 40 if they had them? She remembered Tabit and Hogel bickering good-naturedly around their kitchen table with a great fondness in their eyes she didn't understand when she and Perrin were first married. She thought she loved Perrin then, but it was nothing compared to what she felt now. She smiled as she pictured Perrin and her as a wrinkled, white-haired couple, arguing about who really ate the last piece of pie. Then she heard a roar behind her. He was no longer only hers. The crowd saw him as he fully emerged from the curtains. The roar raced around the entire amphitheater, completely encircling Perrin as he slowly made his way to the center of the platform. 
Before the magistrate could introduce him, his voice was drowned out by the audience cheering and rising to their feet for the savor of Edge. Perrin now stood several paces behind Wibble, still focused on the parchment, but seemingly taking up the entire platform. Karna and Rector Young stepped to the edges of the platform as if his presence pushed them aside. Next, Tamari, Pato began to laugh at the crowd's enthusiastic reaction. He can't even kick a ball straight, he shouted to his mother, barely audible over the noise. But he grinned as he stood as well. Jaitsi was on her feet too, clapping loudly. Mari could hardly see her husband anymore as she stood up because tears blurred her vision. To read the letters was one thing. To see thousands of people on their feet cheering and now shouting general was overwhelming. Perrin hadn't raised his head but was still staring at the parchment in his hand. Something rigid and worrying seemed to have overtaken him. Oh no. Mari murmured and took a few quick steps to the edge of the raised platform. If she was feeling overcome by the enthusiasm of the crowd, what might he be feeling? Shem was right. It was too much, too soon. She wished Perrin didn't have his father's sword strapped to his side. Brillin caught her eye. She shook her head briefly at him and shrugged. The crowd was relentless, growing louder every moment, wanting to be acknowledged by Colonel Shin. Brillin walked over to Perrin, put a hand on his shoulder, and said something in his ear. Perrin shook his head, flashed his friend a brief smile, then finally looked out to the crowd. Mari didn't think they could get any louder, but they did, to deafening levels. Perrin stared straight out, slowly scanning the people now chanting, General Shin! General Shin! in unison. He pivoted gradually, his eyes traveling around the entire enclosure until he returned to his original position. Mari's worried gaze darted between Brillin and her husband. Brillin remained by Perrin's side, gently taking him by the sword arm, as if worried he might draw the blade. But Perrin glanced at him again, nodded in assurance, and took several steps to the front to the platform. Karna remained behind him, his arms folded, his eyebrows furrowed, his stance ready. The chant of General Shin continued, now accompanied by foot stomping which trembled the ground. Perrin looked down at his wife and winked. She blinked back, stunned. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, she mouthed at him. He could read her lips, she was sure. One of his eyebrows went up subtly, and he looked out again at the crowd, which, surprisingly, was even louder. Mari shook her head. He always had a natural flair for the dramatic, and now he was working the crowd. Oh, that man! she exclaimed, but no one could hear her chuckling. Eventually, Perrin held up his hand, and the chanting crowd fell silent. He turned slowly, pushing his hand forward as he faced each section of the amphitheater, and everyone obediently sat down. Mari suppressed a giggle and took her seat between her children. If the administrators could see what power he had over the citizenry, they would have suspected an overthrow was in the works. The crowd watched Colonel Shin expectantly. He waited until there was no sound, then waited three seconds more to make sure the thousands surrounding him were breathless with anticipation before he finally held up the parchment. We are here to remember, he emphasized, his deep voice booming out beyond the amphitheater. To remember the events that happened one year ago today. I'm here to read the names of those who perished in the land tremor here in Edge and those whose relatives lived in Moreland. Remembering the ones we lost is the greatest honor we can give them. The raucous energy of the crowd was replaced by hushed reverence as Perrin's voice rang out loud and clear. Salida Avati, Wills Avati, Yanali Brighter. He slowly recited each name with great solemnity, accompanied by sniffs and sobs scattered throughout the crowd. By the time he read the 204th and last name, People were openly weeping, and a heavy mood was tangible. Noiselessly, Perrin began to roll up the parchment. 
until someone near the back shouted, General Ralph and Mrs. Joriana Shin. The audience gasped as the words shattered the silence. Perrin stopped in mid-roll and looked up. His jaw shifted, and the crowd collectively held their breath. After a frozen moment, just long enough to become uncomfortable, he nodded once and announced, We thank you for sacrificing your morning to be with us. You've all given so much over the past year, and we are stronger together because of it. May the Creator remember all of you as you remember Him. Thank you. He pivoted and headed to the back of the stairs of the platform. The audience rose to their feet again, cheering and applauding and calling. But the Colonel, as if not hearing any of it, trotted down the stairs and out of sight. The Magistrate, however, took to the middle of the platform as if the applause were for him while Karna and Rector Young waved and followed after Perrin. All alone, Wibble beamed and headed down the front stairs looking for hands to shake while the crowd began to file out. But as soon as Perrin had turned to exit the platform, Mari had set off in a quick jog to find him. He reached their oak at the same time she did. The sound of the audience followed him, and he sat on the bench by the spring, staring at the parchment in his hands. Worried, Mari sat next to him. Karna and Rector Young paused at the bottom of the stairs and anxiously watched Mari. She gave them a hopeful smile and nodded that they could go, but the two men looked at each other and only stepped to the side to wait. You did a wonderful job, Mari whispered in Perrin's ear. They love you. Can you hear it? He scoffed. They love the idea of me, but they don't really love me. But that's all right. I can live with it. So what's wrong? Your eyes are darkening again. My eyes are always dark. You know what I mean, Perrin. After a quiet moment, he said, Oh, Mari, I never realized how much power there was in the words General Shin. He reached over and put his hand on her knee. If ever it happens, he paused and shook his head. Mari waited, trying to read his enigmatic expression. He never wanted the title of general, but he must have entertained the thought while thousands of citizens practiced it on him. Perhaps, he finally whispered, we best pray that day never comes. Zena sat on one side of the large desk at the command tower, drafting a new training schedule. His way, not the captain's and based on information Karna told him about garters and moorland. It was also a good way to keep an eye on Thorn, who sat across from him reviewing personnel files. Thick tension hovered between them like an angry vulture daring either of the men to actually look up and acknowledge its presence. For the past week, Shem had remained annoyingly close to Thorn. They took their meals at the same time were scheduled in the office at the same hours, and when Thorne spied him on the compound, Shem made it a point to sharpen his new long knife. He realized it was best to carry a couple of them at all times. That morning of the remembrance ceremony, a strange sound carried up to the tower. Shem paused in his writing and listened. He looked over at Thorne's hand and saw that he, too, had stopped writing to pay attention to the quiet roar coming from the village. Then the noise developed a rhythm. Shem didn't mean to, but he found himself watching Thorn. Thorn looked up at him at the same time, and the tension froze into an icy chill. But the sound that was growing in volume demanded that the two men continue their indignant staring contest another time. Thorn stood abruptly and made his way to the large window, which sat on metal pins, allowing it to swing open. Zenas leaped to reach the other side to open it first, but not quickly enough. Thorn unlatched the frame and swung it open with a small triumphant smile. The echoing noise was now distinct and carried all the way to the command tower. Thorn's smile faded as the cold morning air hit his face along with the sound. The corner of Shem's mouth tugged upward slightly as he glared back at Thorn. In the air floated the chant, General Shen, General Shen. When Pato got home after the soldiers escorted their family to keep his father from being mobbed by admirers, 
He ran to his room to take off the confining black suit, which his grandmother had bought for him last year. He was pleased to see when he put it on that morning that it was getting tight and short. Not only would he never have to wear it again, but he was finally growing. He threw it on the floor, put on his regular shirt and trousers, then, feeling a touch of guilt, gathered up his grandmother's suit and respectfully folded it. He opened the wardrobe doors and placed the suit carefully on the shelf where it had sat the past year. Then he slid out the envelope that lay hidden under it and pressed it to his chest. He checked to make sure his bedroom door was still closed before he whispered to the air, Grandfather, you should have seen them. You should have heard them. If someone had a crown, they would have made him king this morning. They were already chanting General Shin. It was all coming together in some sort of way, and Peta was seeing the signs. As they had passed the abandoned peach orchard he and Young had worked last year, Peta was stunned to see that the trees were so heavy with blossoms that the air fairly stank of them. There was some kind of meaning there. Young would likely quiz him later about nourishing the trees and his father grinning again and the northern half of the world chanting general at him. Peto gave the envelope a quick kiss, then slid it back under the suit and shut the wardrobe doors. When Colonel Shin reached the fort after the ceremony, after changing out of his metal heavy dress uniform, he marched through the compound and straight up to the command tower. The door to his office was slightly open, and the only person at the large desk in the forward office was Zenas. Perrin raised one questioning eyebrow at Shem. Shem gave his commander a slight wince, raised both eyebrows briefly, then nodded once to the window. Perrin narrowed his eyes at the master sergeant and tilted his head slightly to the side, twitching his left eye. Shem tipped his head to the office door and curled his upper lip. The colonel winked. The longest conversation they'd ever had without speaking a word was over three minutes, but the silent communication they had a week ago far surpassed that. All kinds of new expressions had to be wordlessly created and deciphered, and Shem's message had left Perrin completely speechless and then completely enraged. In fact, he'd leaped over his desk, his long knife in hand, and lunged for his office door, which Shem barred. You can't, Shem had shouted. You know you can't. I vowed I wouldn't say a word. And you didn't, Perrin seethed. Very disturbing actions, however. Now move, Zenas, or you're going to regret it. No, you'll regret it if you do. You can't kill the captain. I'm just going to give him something to remember me by, Perrin growled. Every time he looks in the mirror or relieves himself. You can't. You can't do any permanent damage that his parents and grandparents might notice when he goes to the dinner in a few weeks, Shem reminded him, wrenching the long knife out of his grip. Perrin squinted. That bruised jaw he got last night, not kicked by an errant horse, right? Shem smiled and held up his fist. Feisty little steed, isn't it? And he was walking stiffly this morning because of your daughter's kicking ability. As Perrin smiled acerbically in approval, Shem suggested, Confront Thorn only once you've calmed down a bit. Besides, Jates, he didn't want you to know, remember? And why is that? He snapped. Shem only had to give him a long, studied look. And Perrin's shoulders sagged. She had plenty of reasons to not trust her father. But I trust you, Shem said, reading his thoughts. Just not at this moment. He slipped Perrin's long knife into his own waistband. I'll give it back to you tomorrow, and hand me Ralph's sword for the day while we're at it. It had taken Perrin a few days to feel in control enough to address the putrid, out-of-control mushroom that had threatened to overtake his fort for the past year. Today, he knew what to do. Still, as he took a quiet step toward his office, he paused and retrieved his long knife from his hip. He set it down noiselessly in front of Shem, who snorted into his jacket sleeve. Perrin pointed a finger of warning at his friend, and Shem nodded, sliding the knife into his boot. 
Colonel Shin took a quick breath, sent one last link to his master sergeant that said, Enjoy the show, and pushed his office door open with a loud bang. Captain Thorne jumped in the chair he was sitting in and dropped a quill. He looked up, startled, as Colonel Shin walked into the office and slammed the door behind him. He placed his hands on the desk and leaned ominously toward Captain Thorne. Lemuel gulped. I know what you've been up to, Captain, the Perrin snarled. The Captain turned white. And despite what you may have heard this morning, you don't need to draft your little message. I don't want their jobs or even to be a general. Tell them that when you go back to the mansion tomorrow. Captain Thorne relaxed a little, but his eyes hardened. Why, Colonel, he simpered, whatever makes you think I'm writing something about this morning's because I know you, he sneered. Because I know why you're in my fort and what you've been doing. So I'm telling you, Captain, I'm not standing for it anymore. Things are going to be different starting now. This is my fort, my men, my procedures. And if I want something changed, you will present it to me for my approval. Second in command means you see it that my orders are fulfilled. You do not make your own. Is that clear? Captain Thorne's jaw dropped ludicrously. Perrin leaned even closer. And if I ever find out that you've been touching something that belongs to me again, the colonel eyed his chair. The Captain Thorne was warming without permission. I'll begin to show my displeasure by breaking both of your arms and then I move downward. Is that understood? Thorn. Captain Thorn quickly got up from the Colonel's chair and turned a nauseating shade of gray. He snatched up his papers, mumbling a sorry, sir, somewhere in there, and started for the door, trying to find a way around the Colonel as he blocked the exit. Thorn! The captain froze in his tracks, gripping the door handle. Perrin stepped up to him, his face just inches from Thorn's. That includes my daughter! he roared. Then he did what some poor girl's father should have done to him when he was 17. Perrin slugged Thorn square on the jaw, right on top of Shem's weak old bruise, which was just starting to fade. Thorn dropped like a log, his pages and folders sprawling across the floor, along with his body. Vicious delight filled Perrin as he hovered over the prone form fading out of consciousness, and he massaged his fist, which was eager to punch him a dozen times more. Several targets on the captain's body presented themselves, and just as Perrin raised his arm to let it connect with another, the office door opened. Shem stood there, his hands on his hips, his expression that of perfect innocence. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Colonel, what happened here? Did our captain slip? He said loudly for the benefit of the sergeant and the corporal who'd come up the stairs. Perrin dropped his arm and shook his head sadly. He did, stumbled right against that cabinet. He showed Shem his happy fist before unclenching it. The sergeant and corporal leaned around Shem to see Thorn. He tripped and caught the corner on his jaw just where that steed kicked him the other night, and bam, down he went. Perrin ignored the snickering of the enlist. Thorn was coming too, groaning as he held his face. Move! Perrin blinked in almost believable concern. What was that, Captain? Ready to sit up? Careful now, you're a bit clumsy. My tooth! he exclaimed as he struggled to sit up. With fury in his eyes, he glared at Perrin. You knocked off my tooth. The sergeant behind Shem said, spit out that blood, Thorn, before you speak again. Almost sounded as if you were accusing our colonel of causing your little accident, sir. Thorn looked up into four unsympathetic faces. When his eyes met Perrin's rock-hard glare, something of the captain's brittle demeanor cracked. Yes, things are going to be different now. Both men knew it. Thorn coughed into a handkerchief the corporal handed him, filling it with a mouthful of blood and a broken molar. Even though each of the four men reluctantly offered him a hand, 
He ignored them all and unsteadily got up on his own. Sergeant, Perrin said, would you please help Thorne down to the surgeons? Nothing they can do about that tooth until he gets to Idemia later this week. Maybe one of those new dentists can figure out something for him. Feeling a bit guilty about that, Perrin shoved his proud and throbbing fist in his pocket. Until then, the hospital can stop the bleeding and check him for any other injuries. The sergeant winked slyly at his colonel before he led a wobbly thorn down the stairs. Perrin also noticed the corporal grinning broadly before Shem subtly shook his head at him. But then Shem followed it up by returning a quick grin. Perrin kicked Thorne's papers, he'd have the corporal gather them later, and looked out of his south-facing windows. Now, Ida Mia, he whispered, because more and more I suspect that's where all of you are really from, send me what you're planning. I'm back in command. Lieutenant Afra was brushing down his horse, his daily reprieve from the hovering of the captain who kept his horse streak in his own private stable. When he felt the presence behind him, he turned slowly to face it, then immediately stood at attention. At ease, Afra, please, I was just passing, Colonel Shin said as he ran his hand down the haunches of Afra's horse. Lovely mare, isn't she? Always been one of my favorites. I'm glad to see you giving her so much attention. She deserves it. Afra stared at his commander. For the past few weeks, he'd been far easier. But too often, he'd seen Shin suddenly turn like a rabid dog. Yes, sir? Shin smiled at him with surprising softness in his eyes. I wanted to thank you for acting as my shield this morning. Getting me into the amphitheater? A little crowded, wasn't it? He chuckled tightly. Afra dared to smile a little. Yes, sir, I don't think anyone expected such a turnout. Me most especially. I hadn't realized before you're my same height. We give the tailors a fit, don't we? Afra swallowed, still not sure what any of this was about. I suppose we do, sir. Shin looked him up and down. But you're not as bulky as I am. Rather on the lean side, Afra. You could become quite impressive with some extra muscle. Don't enjoy the food here? Afra reddened. No, the food's just fine, sir. I've just, I've just not had much of an appetite, sir. Actually lost a little weight since I came here. Something in Shin's eyes looked pained, as if he knew he was part of the cause of the officer's anxiety. I'm sorry to hear that, Afra, he said quietly. Truly. He ran his hand over the horse again. But I have a remedy for that. Like you, I've lost a bit of muscle this past year and I need to get it back. What I'm planning can get you bigger and stronger as well. What do you say? Afra cocked his head, unsure of the colonel's direction. Sir? Want to be my training partner? He leaned closer. You see, Zenus used to be... But since he's beaten me twice in that ridiculous strongest soldier race, he thinks he's got me for good. I want to surprise him in six moons' time at the next harvest season. But I need a partner to push me. So, how about it? A half-hour run before every midday meal, then a long run each week through Edge? Afra, completely taken aback, took another moment before he could respond with, Sir, I'd be honored. Thank you. Shin grinned and slapped him on the back. Good. Afra, how old are you anyway? Twenty-five, sir. Shin nodded. Twenty-five. Good age. We're going to make it a great age. This will be at least one way you can get the upper hand over a lower man. He raised his eyebrows meaningfully. Afra just looked at him blankly, knowing the colonel was trying to communicate something but he had no idea how to read the man. Shin inspected the horse's leg, picked off an invisible speck, and said, hmm, a thorn. One of the creator's most irritating creations, wouldn't you agree? Just gets under your skin and... He twisted the invisible thorn in the air and made a face. Offer caught on that time and smiled broadly. Indeed I do, sir. 
Shin winked at him, completely throwing the poor lieutenant. Then tomorrow, before midday meal, leave your jacket in the office. And, lieutenant, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but... The colonel looked down briefly, sincerely ashamed. I don't even know your first name. Usually I'm much better at these kinds of things. No one in the fort had ever asked his first name. It's John, sir. John Afra. My father pronounced it Jan, but my mother thought it sounded like people were tired of me, so she and everyone else pronounced the J. The colonel smiled. Unusual, but I like it. John suits you. You're definitely not tiring. Well, then again, depending on how fast you run, maybe you are. Well then, John, tomorrow? Absolutely, sir. Captain Thorne picked at his food in the mess hall, sitting next to Raiden, who eyed him. You're a bit quiet today, sir, said Raiden, in his usual and ingratiating manner. Jaw bothering you, I suspect? Rotten luck, getting hit in the same spot twice in one week? Up to going home tomorrow, the dinner and all? I can't wait till I get an invitation, he hinted. All those officers, all their experience, just to sit at the same table as them, soaking in their wisdom, marinating in their stale jokes, thorn intoned, their same old stories, their exaggerations. He dropped his fork in disgust. Not what you think it is, Raiden. I'm better off staying here. Why, sir? Raiden asked. I would think you'd be most eager to get back. Especially considering what happened this morning with the colonel. Thorne's head snapped up. What do you know about this morning with the colonel? Raiden frowned. What everyone knows, sir. The chant of general. I'm sure they heard it down in Idamea. If not, what a juicy bit of news you'll be able to deliver. Thorne's shoulders relaxed slightly. Oh, oh that... Yes, they won't be too happy to hear about that, I assure you. His shoulder twitched, along with a few other things, he mumbled to himself. Such as? None of your business, Thorne snapped. Slag, Raiden, what do you want from me anyway? The lieutenant rocked back in surprise. I just want to help, sir. It's you and me holding this fort together. Everyone knows that. Thorne drummed his fingers and looked out across the soldiers, talking, laughing, and not interacting with him. They were afraid and unsure of what he meant to them, which meant he was becoming the perfect officer. Until today. He noticed Chin changing some weeks ago. He was far more alert, no longer napped, and was walking and talking among his men and even laughing with them. And then, today all of which was completely unexpected. First was the message from his father that he anticipated hearing news about Lemuel's engagement to the daughter of a certain colonel. Then there was the show of solidarity for Shin at the amphitheater, followed by the discussion in the command office. Apparently, some officers do believe their daughters. Everything Lemuel had been doing was unraveling and he'd have to report all of that to his father. Edge was a far safer place than Idamia right now. No one appreciates what we do, Thorne brooded, but I'll find out what to do next. There was nothing he dreaded more than that. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you.